everyone, welcome to Hearth of Hymonia. My name is Kate, and today we're going to talk all about the hearth in Greco-Roman religious practices. What the hearth is, um, some deities associated with fire and the hearth, uh, evidence of practices and worship and things like that. So just a little bit about myself since this is my first video. I've been studying ancient Greece and Rome for close to 15 years now. Um, I studied the languages in school, Latin and Greek, and I specialized in ancient magic. Now that I'm not in academia anymore, I wanted to start this channel and um, I have a website as well um, with a blog and things like that and I'll link that down below um, just to sort of share what I've learned and share what I'm still learning. Um, I don't consider myself an expert at all. I consider myself very much a beginner still when it comes to these kinds of things, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what I find interesting what matters to me, uh, and so that's why I started this channel. So this channel is mostly going to be about ancient magic, Greece and Rome, other parts of the Mediterranean, and spirituality sort of more broadly speaking. And I'm also going to be sharing a little bit of my journey uh, and what I do in my life uh, when it comes to spirituality and the way that I incorporate some of these themes into my own life. Uh, so that's the purpose of the channel. Um, it's primarily going to be a classics channel, resources for Greco-Roman religion and spirituality. So with all that being said, let's get into today's topic, which is the hearth in Greco-Roman religious practice. So what is the hearth? Close your eyes for a minute and conjure up an image of a hearth in your mind. You're probably thinking of a fireplace, maybe located centrally inside of a home, used for cooking, making heat uh, to heat the house, providing light, and so on and so forth. Now, not everyone in Greece and Rome would have had this kind of fire in their house, especially people living in urban centers, living in cities. They would have been in very cramped quarters and they wouldn't necessarily have had a hearth in their living space. But that doesn't mean that the concept of the hearth wasn't important to Greek and Roman people in terms of, of religion and spirituality. It definitely was a central aspect of Greco-Roman religion. In fact, in Latin, the word for hearth was focus. And that's where we get the word focus today, because it's something that you draw your attention towards. So you can see it was hugely important as a concept, even if everybody didn't have one in their homes. So let's think conceptually about fire for a minute. Uh, when I say the word fire, what comes to mind? Maybe you're thinking about the hearth fire that we talked about earlier, Maybe you're thinking of mythology when Prometheus risked everything to bring fire to humans and fire is the cornerstone of human civilization. I mean, without it, we have nothing, right? Or maybe you're thinking of the awful forest fires and wildfires that we've had recently around the world in places like California and Australia. Fire has this sort of double-edged sword type situation where on the one hand it's the cornerstone of all human civilization and life it helps us to see in the dark it cooks our food for us it provides warmth in the cold but it is also hugely hugely destructive as well and this is not something that was lost on the Greeks and Romans. In Greco-Roman mythology, there are a number of deities devoted to fire um, and different aspects of fire. Um, so you have the sun gods, right? You have Helios, um, Apollo, uh, and various other. Those are pretty much the main two. But really, 
the sun as this sort of life bringer, but also, again, very dangerous, something you don't want to mess with. Beyond the sun gods, you have gods like Hephaestus, whom the Romans called Vulcan. They're pretty much almost the same god. Hephaestus and Vulcan are associated with blacksmiths, so using fire to create things out of metal, to create tools and weapons. So again, a very necessary craft for human civilization, human advancement, but such a dangerous job, such a dangerous job. And Vulcan was also associated, if you can tell by the name, with volcanoes. Um, there are volcanoes everywhere. The Mediterranean has a bunch of volcanoes. The Greeks and Romans knew what volcanic activity looked like and what volcanic activity could do uh, to a place like Pompeii, for example, or Herculaneum that got completely destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. That's fire as well. It's in a different form, but that's fire. There's always this dual association with fire between the positive aspects of it, it's helpful, it's necessary, it brings life, um, but on the other hand, it's incredibly dangerous and destructive. So there's always that dual association in mind when we're talking about fire in a Greco-Roman context. So one important way that the Greeks and Romans interacted with fire in a religious context is through eternal flames. Now, there are eternal flames all over the world, both in ancient civilizations and in modern ones. Here in the United States, we have an eternal flame. There's a fire burning at the tomb of John F. Kennedy in Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia. Uh, it's kept going perpetually. It never goes out even at night. So what is the purpose of something like this? It doesn't really provide any light or heat or anything. It's outside, it's in the middle of like a platform. So it's not really doing too much. You can't even really get near it. But the purpose of it isn't practical, it's symbolic. An eternal flame signifies something that is or should be or something that we're striving to make permanent in the United States, in the context that I was just talking about, what is it that we're trying to make permanent? I guess it depends on who you ask. American values, freedom, all of that grand old American stuff. Um, but in the ancient world, they had these as well. Uh, and they didn't all necessarily have to symbolize the same thing. So the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, which was the seat of probably the most famous oracle in ancient history had one of these eternal flames. People would go to get prophecies, um, so they would submit their question and then the priestess inside the temple would answer the question, send it back to the person, they would leave offerings, generous gifts, and so on and so forth. But there was an eternal flame there. So what does that symbolize? It symbolizes I mean, knowledge, specifically divine knowledge, brought down from the gods. So these prophecies that were given at this temple of Apollo were said to come from Apollo. He was supposed to inspire the priestesses and give them the words that they were speaking, very much like Prometheus gave fire to humans for human civilization to thrive. It was a gift from the gods. And that's something you want to perpetuate. It's something you want to keep around, right? So that's why there was an eternal flame in that location and it lasted as long as the temple was in active use. And keep in mind as well that they didn't have gas and electric and all of the things that we have to keep something going. It had to be constantly tended by priests and priestesses, people working at the temple. They had to maintain this 24-7. It was a huge job. It was very, very clearly important to devote that amount of time and resources towards keeping something like this alive. The Romans also had an eternal flame as part of their 
religious observance um, on the state level. They had a temple dedicated to Vesta, the goddess of the hearth, in the Roman Forum, which is sort of like the downtown of the main capital of the Roman Empire. And this temple had one of these eternal flames. Now, before I talk about Vesta, I want to back up a little bit and talk about the Greek goddess of the hearth, Hestia, um, because I haven't had a chance to mention her yet. So Hestia is obviously the Greek hearth goddess. She is considered one of the oldest goddesses, and even though we use feminine words to describe her, we say she, her, goddess, uh, she wasn't really ever anthropomorphized. She was very rarely depicted in human form. She was considered the embodiment of the hearth fire. So the fire that burns in your fireplace isn't just a symbol of Hestia, it is Hestia herself. She's not always counted in the 12 Olympians because she sort of straddles the line between the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. She can't exactly leave her place at the hearth to go and do other things because remember the flame has to be eternal. Now we don't have a lot of archaeological evidence for temples dedicated to Hestia. We have much more literary evidence. There are a number of Homeric hymns written about her. Um, there's two directly devoted to her, and I have put translations of those on my website, which I'll link down below if you want to check those out in full. There's a number of poems and literary works that reference her. Uh, so she's well known and she's very important, but she's not worshipped in the same way that a lot of the other gods, particularly the Olympians, were worshipped. There's not a lot of temple activity, there's not a lot of dedicated specific festivals to Hestia. Worship of Hestia was more of an individual thing, um, or it was incorporated into other ritual contexts. So what I mean by that is offerings were given to Hestia at the beginning and the end of every meal to sanctify the meal, to make it holy, because again, one of the main functions of a hearth fire is to cook food. I'm sure there's a lot more that I could say, but I want to keep this video kind of short. So I want to move on now talking again about Vesta in the Roman context. So Vesta is much more of a typical goddess, I guess you could say. There's a temple dedicated to her. She's attended by a college of priestesses. These priestesses, they're called the Vestal Virgins. Uh, there's so, so, so much to say about the Vestal Virgins, so I'm actually going to make an entire episode dedicated just to them. It, it's a whole topic and I can't do it justice in just this video, but suffice it to say that the main function of the Vestal Virgins was to tend the eternal flame that was kept at the temple complex in the Roman Forum where the Vestal Virgins also lived. So we know that eternal flames symbolize something. In the Roman context, having the Temple of Vesta be in the Roman Forum, which is the center of the city, the city of Rome, which is the center of the empire, it takes on a much, much, much more important and crucial role for Roman state religion. So the eternal flame for the Romans symbolized that the gods were on Rome's side. They were appeased by whatever Rome was doing to keep them happy, sacrifices, temples, festivals, things like that. They were firmly keeping Rome safe and secure and prosperous. If that flame goes out, regardless of how it happens, if that flame goes out, that's a catastrophe for Rome. So they absolutely had to keep it burning at all times. And they did. For centuries and centuries, this fire was kept going. In the Roman context, Rome is a much more centralized state than Greece ever was. And all aspects of Roman life were more centralized. So you can see, at least on the state level, that this was a huge, important aspect of Roman religious life. When it comes to individual worship of Vesta, uh, naturally, we don't have as much information about individual practice as we do about state practice or larger practices. 
We do know that there was a festival dedicated to Vesta called the Vestalia, or Westalia, I guess, if you want to use the Roman pronunciation. It occurred for about a week in the middle of June, and actually, I, and I didn't even do this on purpose, when this video will be posted, we're actually going to be in the middle of this festival. So happy Vestalia, everybody. Uh, during this festival, the temple in the Roman Forum would be open to the public. So typically you could go to a temple, you could leave your offerings, you could worship the gods, but you couldn't go all the way inside. At certain times, like the Vestalia for the Temple of Vesta, the doors were opened and women would go inside and leave offerings. Why women? Because the hearth fire is primarily a domestic thing, um, even if it's in Rome, like on a state level. Uh, there's all sorts of symbolic parallels between the family and the state. So suffice it to say that this was a very much domestic, very female, feminine sort of festival. So this festival actually comes up in a poem. Uh, Ovid writes about it in his Fasti, which is a, a sort of calendar religious type poem. Um, so I've translated the Vesta section and that's on my website as well. So again, you can find the link in the description if you wanted to read that, the Latin and the English together. Now, before I end this video, I wanted to talk a little bit about modern hearth practices. This is something that I hope to do, if not in every episode, at least in most of my videos. So modern hearth practices, many people who identify as witches who call themselves witches uh, like to use the term hearth witch to describe themselves. And a lot of people who practice paganism, and there is some overlap, although it's not 100%, a lot of modern pagans choose to incorporate hearth goddesses like Hestia and Vesta into their ritual practices. So as far as I can tell, um, Anna Franklin, who wrote this book, The Hearth Witch's Compendium, um, came up with the term hearth witch, at least that's what she claims. Let me read it to you. She says, I am a hearth witch. Though there are many paths to magic, this is the term I invented some years ago to describe my own. I consider my house to be a sacred place, a temple of the gods, where I live, work, and worship. As I make a fire in the hearth or light a candle, I honor the living goddess of the hearth fire, known as Bridget in Ireland, Hestia in Greece, and Vesta in Rome, and her presence in my home. And then she goes on from there. So as far as I know, Anna Franklin is the one who came up with the term hearth witch, but a lot of people have adopted it. Now, Anna Franklin, in that same introduction, a couple pages later, describes herself as an ardent feminist. Um, so she's coming at hearth practices as a way to sort of reclaim women's work, um, in particular things like herbalism, home remedies, things like that. Uh, so that's sort of her path, but that's not everyone's path. Um, one of my favorite channels on YouTube, she's just called Hearth Witch, and if you're here, you probably know about her. Um, she came at it from a different angle. She was very much interested in working with fire. She started out working uh, magic with the different elements. And I'm sorry if I'm getting her story a little bit mixed up. It's been a, a while since I heard her tell it. But she came to call herself a hearth witch through her association with fire and the British fire goddess Brigid. So that's another way that people get into the hearth practice. Um, and so it's still very much alive today for a number of different reasons. And I guess I should conclude by talking a little bit about my own journey and why I chose to include Hearth as part of my channel name, Hearth of Hymonia. So I'm not huge into labels. I don't want to call myself a Hearth Witch necessarily. Um, I'm really not into spell work and I don't worship any deities. I'm not pagan at all. I like the term Hearth as it's divorced from Hearth Witch and pagan worshipping Brigid or Hestia or Vesta. Um, I like the concept of putting the home and the family 
at the center of spirituality. So my spiritual practice in the last couple of years has really, really focused on creating a safe and sacred space in my own home, um, making it a place where people want to hang out. So that's the main reason why I chose the term hearth. I, of course, also absolutely love Greek and Roman belief systems, um, religion, spirituality, magic, all of that. I absolutely love it. Having Vesta in the back of my mind uh, also brings me a lot of joy as I make this uh, channel. Now, I don't have a hearth. I don't have a fireplace in my house. I live in the south. It is currently 91 degrees out. I just looked <laughs> at the uh, temperature gauge over there. It's 91 degrees out. It's so hot and humid, but I do have this little bumblebee jasper tower and I don't know if this is gonna capture it if I if I go like this I'll insert like a close-up of it but this bumblebee jasper tower looks just like a little fireplace so this is my hearth in the house uh, I love it so much I think it's so cute so that's basically my story um, in the next video I put out I'm going to talk a little bit about my space and some of the things that I'm doing to change the space around, make it more homey, things like that. But for now, I wanted to close this video by reading a little bit of my translation of one of the Homeric hymns to Hestia. So this is the beginning of the Homeric hymn to Hestia, number 29, and again, the full translation will be on my website, but I'll read you just a little bit of it. Hestia, you who have attained by lot an eternal seat the highest honor in the lofty halls of everyone, both the immortal gods and men who walk on earth, you have a fair gift and honor. For without you, there is no feast for mortals, where the leader doesn't pour out honey-sweet wine first and last for Hestia. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope that you learned something. If you liked this video, let me know by leaving a thumbs up or a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Like I've said, the sources, the bibliography for everything that I've talked about today is going to be in the description, and I've also listed it over on my website if you want to go check that out. And if you're interested in this kind of content, I plan to post a lot more videos like this. Greco-Roman belief is a wide topic, and I'm excited to share more of it with you. So if you're interested in this type of thing, go ahead and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.